Hi, this is Dr. Diane Gayhart, and this is my lecture on functional family therapy and evidence-based treatments for delinquent youth and their families. This uh, lecture goes with my textbook series, um, specifically the Mastering Competencies in Family Therapy text, as well as Theory and Treatment Planning in Family Therapy, both of which are available through Cengage, and you can get these digitally, chapter by chapter, or in uh, hardback. Functional family therapy is a well-recognized evidence-based treatment for working with adol adolescents who are having conduct behavior type issues and working with their families. And this approach is widely, has been widely adopted by um, many county and government agencies looking, wanting to work with this very difficult population. In a nutshell, the least you need to know about functional family therapy it is an empirically validated uh, family therapy treatment. And what that means is that clinical studies have, uh, very careful studies have been conducted. Um, looking at the outcome, it is a manualized treatment. So, you know, it follows a very specific um, outline. I mean, that said, it's still going to have areas where individual, you know, therapists will vary in how they deliver it. But it is a manualized treatment, and it's specifically designed to work with uh, youth dealing with conduct disorder and delinquency. And it is a family treatment and um, it is one of four widely recognized evidence-based treatments for this very difficult to treat population. And all of them um, basically use a systemic structural foundation in terms of how they intervene. And so this um, approach draws from many of the traditional systemic and uh, structural concepts um, and, and has kind of research has been conducted essentially uh, and how to use these uh, traditional systemic and structural and some cognitive behavioral concepts to help families with uh, youth who are having severe conduct uh, issues. And this, the name of the approach comes from this concept of looking at the function of the behavior. So just like all systemic approaches, all behavior is viewed as fundamentally adaptive and that it's serving a particular function in the system. These, you know, kids who are diagnosed with conduct disorder aren't bad seeds who, you know, bad people. Um, instead, they see that their behavior plays a very specific function in the system. And they see that there are basically two main functions. One is relational connection. So they're looking at the, whatever the symptomatic behavior is, uh, tip, conduct typically in this, uh, and usually, the, um, kind of acting out conduct behaviors, you know, how is this affecting the relative balance of closeness and ind independence in the family? And how is uh, the other function it may be playing is addressing the relational hierarchy? How is it defining who has influence and control in the system? So, for example, um, if you're looking at a conduct disordered youth who's, um, you know, vandalizing, not attending school, so the question is, how is that behavior affecting the relational connection? So perhaps um, it, it can go both ways here in terms of relational connection. There may be an overly involved kind of micromanaging parent and this behavior helps them to separate from that. Or there could be parents who are very checked out and this behavior forces the parents to have to step in and connect in some way um, to parent the child because they're too checked out. So that's what they mean by the function of the behavior. So they're looking to see what the function is uh, to understand how the teen's conduct issues uh, play a role in the broader system and organizing that system, why it makes sense in the system. And what they're going to focus on is changing the expression of the function, not um, uh, yeah, instead of trying to reorganize the system per se. So for example, if we, if, if we assess the uh, family and we realize that the teen's acting out behavior, pulls in otherwise checked out parents, the goal then would be, so how do we get these parents, how do we get this teen to feel like his parents are checked in without him having to act out, okay? Without him having to bring the police in to force the parents to parent him. So that would be how they work with this. And so then the therapist's primary task is to identify the function of these uh, problem behaviors and find alternative ways to achieve those basic ends without having the severe behavior issues. And that's functional family therapy in a nutshell. So next I wanna talk about what I call the juice or the significant contribution to the field. So 
Um, so this is what one thing that functional family therapy really introduces um, that is unique that can probably be used by any therapist practicing in the field. So one of the things that functional family therapy uh, draws to our attention, as well as some of the other um, evidence-based treatments for conduct disorder, is the importance of a multi-systemic conceptualization and assessment when working with, uh, in this case, conduct disordered youth. And so working with conduct disordered youth, and I think it's very clear when you look across the evidence base for uh, this population, conceptualizing it as an individual teen's problem is, is not the most effective way, uh, according to the research, to, to approach this. It, it's, you really have to look at the individual, the family, the peer system, the school system, and the broader community system dynamics, and how all these pieces are interacting. That when you're dealing with um, adolescents with conduct issues, and I would even extend this to even younger children too, um, looking at conduct issues, it, there's a multi-layered um, systems here, and all of these layers of systems are in one way reinforcing various behaviors, and so that needs to be attended to rather than conceptualizing this as an individual child attitude issue. And uh, it's true with functional family therapy as well as all as the other, um, several other evidence-based treatments for conduct disorder. It really is the focus and the preferred unit of treatment is the family, not the individual youth. And so, and promoting those strong family bonds, as we know, is one of the most critical preventive factors that keeps youth out of trouble. We, that is well documented for decades now. Um, one of the interesting things that they have found is that group treatment of troubled youth together, so like these are like groups um, for teens who've got conduct issues or quote-unquote anger issues, that the, this often augments the antisocial behavior rather than reduces it, which is, I think, a whole, that's a whole other lecture in itself, but I just put, put that out there. And so in functional family therapy, the therapist works very closely with the youth school, the probation officer, peers, community, extended family, with everyone who is influential in this uh, um, child's life or teen's life. And, and so that's important because to really highlight that working with youth who have significant conduct disorder, you just can't sit in your office, you know, maybe, you know, fax out a little, you know, one little statement to the, you know, school counselor that, you know, you're seeing this kid, do you, you know, call me if you've got any questions. That's not how this works, that in functional family therapy, the therapist is very engaged um, and helping to, you know, looking at all these different systems and figuring out how these systems are, need to be also influenced and changed so that it can really support um, the youth in, in having better life choices and being successful in school, successful with peers, and to really be, you know, out of the, um, the trouble that is uh, what characterizes conduct disorder. So next we're going to talk about um, the big picture, the overview of treatment in functional family therapy. So as an, an um, evidence-based treatment, functional family therapy um, has three very clearly defined phases. This is, it has to be a manualized treatment and a similar, if you've listened to the emotionally focused therapy uh, lecture, it's very similar that these phases are used to help uh, the, guide the therapist as they uh, work with the family as to where they are and whether we're progressing and to get a good sense of, of what's going on and whether or not the treatment's working. So in the early phase, um, there's engagement and motivation. When you're working with um, conduct disorder or youth diagnosed with conduct disorder is probably the best way to say it, um, you can imagine that often the youth, if not the entire family, is not happy to be there. They're not wanting to be in treatment often. And so, you know, resistance, being mandated are very common um, issues with this population. So it's very important that the therapist engage the, um, the entire family, not just the youth, and to really develop a trusting connection. Oftentimes, these youth have been through probation, they've been to other, you know, counselors and therapists, and often they're very distrusting of the system, often have not been treated fairly by the system. And so that's very important, and that's um, and the second part of the uh, early phase is the assess is creating motivation and, and, and motivating all members of the family to do something different. And we'll go into detail as to how they do that. And then, of course, in this early phase, they're also assessing the function of the problem behaviors. And so, 
So there's this uh, building relationship, building motivation, and then also assessing uh, for the function of the problems. The middle phase is where we begin this behavioral change. And so here you're um, working on modifying, for all members of the family, their cognitive sets. I mean, typically the parents need to change how they're looking at things and their attitudes and their expectations and their labels of the child or each other. Um, and so you're working with all of them uh, to start uh, looking both at the cognitive, attitudinal, as well as behavioral changes within the family. And then in the later phase, uh, you're generalizing this change to larger social systems. So this can include the school, peers, extended family, the community. Um, and so then you're generalizing in that. And so by creating these multiple layers of, um, uh, and generalizing the change, in these multiple layers of system, you have a much better chance of the change uh, of the ther you know, therapeutic gains being maintained and so that there isn't a relapse uh, in the behaviors. And so when you're working with conduct disordered youth, it's, you know, it's not just the individual, not just the family. You have to look at the entire broader multiple levels of the social system in order to uh, prevent relapse in the future. So next we're going to talk about the therapeutic relationship in functional family therapy. So the therapeutic relationship in functional family therapy is really critical as I mentioned before. So it's important that the therapist have an alliance with all members of the family and oftentimes um, teens and families coming in have you know aren't coming in with a lot of enthusiasm and openness to the process. Oftentimes they're mandated um, by probation or courts to be there Oftentimes they've had um, experiences with other professionals where they didn't feel heard. Uh, and so they may be very suspicious and untrusting. They, the family and or even the teen may feel like, you know, why am I, why do I have to be here? You know, this isn't going to be helpful. You know, I'm not the problem. And so building that alliance and that sense of trust is critical. And, and that is, you really can't, move forward with any you know type of therapy but particularly with this um, approach and this particular client population um, building an alliance with each member of the family is absolutely uh, critical and so similarly there needs to be motivation for all members of the family to be active in the process so not just motivating the teen but the teen you know the teen's parents because typically there's going to be need to be um, change and openness on the part of all of all parties and so the therapist almost expects for clients to be somewhat reluctant, um, especially, you know, and or mandated, and that they may be feeling very hopeless. They may be, the parents may be feeling blamed. The teen may be feeling un, um, fairly blamed. You know, both parents and the teen can be resistant. There can be a lot of, and so the therapist almost expects for, by the time someone is, you know, being assigned to a therapist for functional family therapy, by the time they're in that place, there's almost, you know, the therapist is well aware of this normally isn't, you know, this warm, open, receptive, to the, uh, you know, reception to the process. There, and so part of this is that there is a very sincere um, sense and spirit of respect uh, for the, all members of the family system, as well as a, a spirit of collaboration that you're going to work with the client and, and really um, valuing they, with their experience, their perspectives. You're going to really allow and allow them to create space to share their side of the story and their experiences, and so that's very important that um, both the teen and all members of the family feel very respected, because um, oftentimes the parents have been blamed, and oftentimes they just even if no one said anything, they feel blamed because their child's having behavior pro problems. Another part of the therapeutic relationship that's um, important in functional family therapy is that the therapist is viewed as a credible helper. And so the therapist needs to have credibility in the eyes of the family, that the therapist can help them. Um, they are truly got the best interest of the client, you know, at heart. And that also the therapist is able to do that. And I believe, I mean, that's one of the things that they um, say comes with the evidence-based treatments that through this, by using an evidence-based approach, that this helps build, um, the therapist sense of um, hope and confidence and so they have become across much more as a credible helper uh, to these uh, and that's a very important part of the process so this is a very multi-layered complex uh, 
a therapeutic alliance that needs to be developed between the therapist and the teen and the family. And so it's very important that the therapist makes sure that this is very solid because it's very hard to, to move forward without having a, a strong working alliance. So next we're going to talk about uh, case conceptualization and functional family therapy. So case conceptualization and functional family therapy begins by, begin, begin by looking at the function of uh, the symptoms and specifically the relational function of the symptoms. So what relational function does the symptom serve? And typically, as I mentioned earlier, there are two different um, ways or functions that the symptom, the acting out behavior, the delinquency might serve. One is somehow a related, uh, it's addressing a relational connection, so the balance of closeness and independence. And as I said earlier, you know, acting out uh, conduct issues could result from parents who are overparenting too involved, or it can also re result in um, from parents who are too removed from the parenting of their children. So either way, so the question is, does that explain um, what function the symptom plays in the family? Similarly, the relational hierarchy, so defining who has influence and control. And so does the behavior, um, does the teen's behavior reflect, um, is that tr the child trying to establish control as a parent? Uh, or is the child trying to establish control over the parent? Is the child trying to resist overly controlling, uh, you know, too much parental hierarchy for the child's developmental level? <clears throat> and so the therapist will look at what, when the child acts out, how does the family respond? So for example, the child acts out, the distant parent becomes involved um, because the behavior is so, you know, outrageous. <clears throat> or, um, is the child acting out to get distance from the parent, or is the child acting out to resist the over, the you know the overly controlling parent, you know, or is the child trying to gain control in a system where no one has control, you know, trying to create a sense. Of, so you're going to look at what function and how does the family respond to um, the teens acting out behaviors, and then the question, the real question is. And, uh, how can the family achieve a similar function with more effective relational interaction? So how do we achieve the same basic relational end, which is the child, um, the parents become more involved, or the parents micromanage less, or the, you know, the hierarchy becomes appropriate for the teen's developmental level? How do we achieve that without having the acting out behavior being the mechanism to make that happen? That, that is functional family therapy. That is the crux right there of the case conceptualization. That's the single focus that the therapist is going to, everything else is going to be hinged around that. What's the relational function? How do we achieve that in some other way? So, <coughs> so moving on, um, the therapist is going to look at risk factors. So determining how to do this, you're going to need to look at both the risk, risk factors and protective factors. So there are risk factors in all levels of the system, the individual, child, the parent, the family, the school, community, all and all different elements of the, you know, community. It could be a religious, you know, church that they're part of, the broader neighborhood, you know, a community teen center that they're part of, all of that, those different layers of the community would need to be assessed. But obviously things like violence or even poor behavioral control, those sorts of things, even within the, you know, the teen they would look at, a substance use by the teen or the parents or even in the broader community, looking at emotional, psychological, or educational problems, you know, has a, kid, has a kid been diagnosed with ADHD before, you know, or depression, or what else might be going on? Is there a known learning disability? And looking at the quality of the parent-child attachments, as well as the quality of the parenting skills. Looking at the teen's, you know, f choices for friends. Are they in involved in, you know, after-school, you know, pro-social activities, good, you know, sports, music, anything? Did they used to be? Also looking at just the economic opportunities of the community. Can the parents get, you know, decent jobs to support the family? Um, what's the neighborhood like? Uh, you know, is there violence, you know, gang activity in the neighborhood? So just looking at all of those risk factors. Then the therapist also looks at protective fa factors. So this is assessing the strengths of the family. You know, are there bonds and attachment? Is there, is there supportive parenting? Is there parent involvement at any level, you know? Are there clear limits or discipline? So you're looking for these type of protective factors when um, assessing 
for you know assessing the family and even just having one strong healthy secure attachment bond is a real strength um, that can make a significant difference and so the therapist is going to assess for these sorts of things to see how they can leverage this to help move the teen and the family in a better direction. So case conceptualization and functional family therapy also, as we've mentioned, includes looking at the multiple levels of systems involved. So that includes the extended family, the school system, the peer system, um, there might be a religious, you know, church or temple, looking at that system, the neighborhood, um, the broader community, any groups that you're going to look at and assess all the, the probation system, the, you know, child protective system if they're involved. So you're looking at all those various levels of system and how they're interacting and relating, looking for both um, risk factors as well as the protective factors. Also looking at the community and the culture. So how does the culture and or the community play a part in the client's life? Uh, and so looking at that and again through the multiple layers of system because and uh, assessing for that. And so again, looking at any strengths or resiliency, striving to find a, a healthy balance um, between seeing both the client's problems and also noticing their strengths, because those strengths are going to be very helpful and critical in the, um, in the working phase of treatment. So next we're going to move on to talk about goal setting in functional family therapy. As an evidence-based treatment, functional family therapy has some well-established goals by phase. So the first um, in the initial phase is when you're really enga engaging the family and doing the assessment. Um, you're trying to reduce some of the within family uh, risk factors, which could be substance abuse, you know, lack of involvement. You're also looking to reduce blame and negativity in the family. Uh, typically, there's a lot of blame on the youth for his behaviors and negativity about, you know, he's a bad kid. And so one of the things that gets done in the early phase is reducing that blame, reducing those negative labels. But similarly, the parents might be feeling blamed um, either by the child or society or the teacher or the school or the social worker or probation. And so trying to reduce blame and negativity for all members of the family. And then also in this initial phase, you're working to increase the family alliances and a family-focused view of the problem. So similar to other systemic approaches, you're going to try to move away from just focusing on the identified patient as the one having the problem to looking at it as it's an interactional um, problem, having a family-focused view of what the problem is. In the working phase is where you're really focusing on changing the problem behaviors. So you want to increase behavioral competencies that fit for the family, and we're going to talk about some of the specific ways they do that, such as for parenting and problem solving. And then you're going to match these competencies to the family's relational function. So whatever function, whether it was, um, you know, the balance of closeness versus, you know, independence in the family or related to hierarchy, you're going to try to find ways to use those competencies to match the um, relational function. And then finally, in the closing phase, it's the general, you're doing generalization. And so you're you're increasing the within context of protective factors, so looking and incre incre increasing protective factors at all layers of the system, individual, family, school, social, you know, broader community. You're generalizing these same principles um, and uh, learnings to other areas. So if you learn to problem solve in the family, you're going to learn to problem solve at school. And looking how to support and maintain gains, which means, you know, looking and working with the multiple uh, systems involved to ensure that going forward uh, the, that the child and family are going to be able to maintain their gains. And, and next we're going to talk about how this all gets achieved uh, in, through the interventions. So developing a family focused problem description. So this is in the early phase you're moving from very blame focused definitions of the problem to a family focused definition. So the family focused definition is going to help build a sense of understanding, alliance, and motivation for change. And so first you're going to have each family member to describe what they think the problem is, what caused it, and how it's affecting him or her. And you'll identify and look for, listen for blaming, uh, problem attributions, and, as, and then help the family as they, they see that to begin to see some of the relational patterns and family structure. So, for example, you know, the teen may be blaming the parents for being too controlling, and uh, micromanaging, and here's a, you know a place where the therapist can reframe some of that in terms of 
you know, the parents are trying to, you know, to teach him, you know, how to make good decisions or, you know, how to be safe. They're worried about his safety is where that's coming from. And, and you know, the teen's defiance can also be reframed as, you know, he's in a developmental phase where he's trying to learn his independence and how to handle it well. And so, you know, you know, you got on one hand, you got a teen wanting what's normal and natural to want more independence. And it's very normal and natural for parents to want their kids to be safe. And so obviously we've kind of gotten, you know, you can reframe some of that, how they got into extremes or whatever, you know, you want to say, but you're again moving, you're taking both sides of that. Uh, the, each person's half of the description of the, their half of the problem, making it a much more family focused one and softening the blaming and trying to highlight some of the more benevolent intentions. And, and also helping to see the family, how these individual behaviors are part of the larger family, you know, interaction patterns. So the more the parents are trying to keep the child safe, the more he's resisting because he wants his freedom. He wants to be able to experiment, you know. And so ha helping to reframe things both um, in less blaming ways and more systemic ways, looking at how the more they try to protect him, the more he tries to be independent. And they have this negative kind of downward spiral. So like all systemic approaches, there's this emphasis on identifying the problem interactional sequence. And so again, you're going to look at, you know, what behaviors from all members of the family, not just the main players who are yelling at each other in the living room. I mean, you know, who's hiding in another room? That's also part of the family dance. So looking at the different behaviors from each member of the family, uh, what, you know, behaviors come before the, you know, problem, what come after. And the therapist is also indirectly observing during session to see, you know, what's going on and how people are interacting. And so, and, and sometimes the therapist actually asks very directly about that particular sequence to assess it more carefully. So again, they are assessing the problem sequence to get a sense of what the function is of the symptom behavior and how it works out and what each person's role is in that. So another thing that functional family therapists do is this relational reframing. And it's a cognitive restructuring, helping to change interpret, er, interpretations and meanings about the problem. They use this three-phase process. First, they acknowledge the client's you know, experience and description. So there's a validation in that sense. Then there's a re-attribution. So then looking at an, at an alternative explanation for the same problem behavior. So what may seem like controlling, micromanaging, treating me like a child behavior is how the teen might describe it. The therapist can come back and, and have a, an alternative explanation, you know, where the parent may be focused more on safety. Maybe finding a metaphor that implies an alternative construction, you know, so the, um, so using uh, various ways of, of, of describing this and also using humor to imply that not everything may be as it seems or as extreme as it seems. You know, he never listens to me. That she's always nagging. Um, and so, you know, using humor to play off of that, you know, so she's, you know, she's even nagging, you know, when she's, you know, uh, you know, singing happy birthday to you or whatever it might be. Um, and so being playful with some of that. And then assessing the impact of the reframe and building on it. So as you begin to work on this relational reframe where the parents are trying to keep you safe, how does the teen interpret that and make sense of that? You know, and, and so continuing to look at not just reframing, but to see what they do with it and then to rework it um, in different ways. And so maybe, you know, the teen still resists that description or doesn't find it helpful. Um, there may have been a major loss that the parent ex experienced so that this makes more sense. And so, again, keep uh, reframing, building on it um, to help all members to have less blaming and a much more relational view of the situation. So another intervention or as part of some of this, that they build on what they're called organizational themes. And these are themes to help describe the origin of the problem without blaming any person. So these are metaphors and themes that a therapist can continually used to help make sense of the problem in a less blaming and much more relational frame set. And so, and obviously the therapist does not insist on this, but it has to be mutually developed so that it's meaningful to everyone and that everyone's feeling supported. So oftentimes um, anger can be reframed as hurt or uh, anger may be implying a sense of loss. Um, uh, 
defensive behavior can imply that there is this emotional bond. That's why there's defensiveness. We don't get defensive if we really don't care about the other person. Nagging uh, can relate to what's important. Uh, pain, uh, you know, interferes with listening. Differences can be frightening. Uh, protection often involves shutting others out. So again, you know, playing with these different themes and finding um, n new ways, relational ways to understand what's going on um, in a way that people feel less blamed and, you know, for the problems. So interrupting and diverting. Uh, when working with uh, families with a teen uh, who's got conduct issues, there will frequently be conflict in session. Not always, but frequently. And so it's important that a functional family therapist be prepared and know how to deal with uh, co uh, conflict and to actually actively structure this. And so this is somewhat um, reminiscent of enactments and structural therapy in the sense that the therapist manages a live <laughs> conflict and sometimes you'll hear therapists say, you know, well, you know, I want to assess and see what's going on and see how they argue. And, and certainly with uh, that is not the attitude here in terms of you're not letting conflicts run on, on without the therapist actively structuring and intervening. And that's typically, especially given um, this population. So as soon as the family begins to escalate or there seems to be uh, start some negative self-defeating patterns, the therapist will intervene and interrupt those um, to change the course of the conversation during the session. And this is really done to stop potentially very hurtful interactions and tries to, in keeping therapy on track. So this is very different than the philosophy, oh yeah, just let them argue so you can assess what's going on. They are generally going to intervene, especially, yeah, um, especially if it's happened more than once. You normally don't need to see a family or a couple argued. <laughs> Too much, because uh, uh, once you've seen it, one argument, most of the rest of them are going to go very similarly. And so instead, the therapist actually steps in and coaches and directs them and use role modeling to help them learn how to work through this situation better. And, and so they are very uh, quick to intervene in, uh, as the conflict begins to erupt in session. So process comments are used a lot. Um, once they've interrupted the escalation, um, they use process comments, and these are comments that draw the family's attention to immediately what's going on in the room. So, you know, right now, you know, as you were uh, telling your son how disappointed you were, that he, you know, or you're not going to let him, you know, do a whatever, you know, you can see your son immediately, and you can often start with uh, behavioral uh, descriptions. He immediately looked down at the floor. He, you could see him, you know, immediately shut down and refuse to talk to you. As you continued, because he was being quiet, he shut down even more. And then that's, you know, after two or three rounds of this, that's when he shot back at you. So you can just, you, you interrupt it, and then you help them become um, more conscious, aware of what's going on, noticing both the verbal and nonverbal interaction patterns. And all you can say, as all this was going on, you know, little Susie over there started fidgeting, and mother looked away, and so, you know, you begin to draw everyone's attention to what's going on, both verbally and non-verbally. So uh, these process comments are used to help restructure and help them become aware of their patterns and aware of each person's role and to help restructure and reshape uh, those interactions so that they're more effective and healthier. So oftentimes when working with conduct disordered youth, uh, it Parent skill training is appropriate, and they typically focus on three different areas, setting clear expectations and rules uh, that are developmentally appropriate. So they'll look at what are those expectations and rules and making them very concrete and specific. Then having active monitoring and supervision, so making sure that the parents are very active, uh, taking an active role in monitoring the behaviors of their children, and then having this consistent uh, reinforcement of, uh, of the behaviors and having clear behavioral contingencies. So having, having the parents and teens negotiate reasonable terms is one of the, you know, they work on having them kind of come up with something reasonable and that's more likely to be beneficial and everyone's usually more willing to adhere to that. And so they will often, uh, you know, and parent skill training depends on what's going on, may or may not always be used, but frequently is uh, used, especially with this um, population when they've gotten to the point where they're being referred by the courts for therapy. A 
another set of interventions that is uh, frequently used in functional family therapy is mutual problem solving. This is basically a subset of parenting skills. And again, here you're parenting typically with older adolescents. And so they use this uh, mutual problem solving where typically they identify what the problem is, identifying a desired outcome, agreeing on how to accomplish this goal, identifying potential obstacles, and then reevaluating those outcomes. And so having the teens and the parents work together to come up with realistic goals and ways to achieve it. I mean, typically, most teens would agree that they would like to graduate past high school classes, you know, and they, they too want to graduate from high school. It's not just their parents who want them to graduate. And so then, but you would work with the teens on coming up with what's a reasonable, um, you know, grade point average to be shooting for, what's a reasonable way to be achieving that, what are the reasonable, you know, if you're, if you, you know, what's going to happen if um, you're, you're not meeting the goals, what's a reasonable, you know, course of action there. And so oftentimes you can, you can help parents and children learn how to solve some of the problems of working together. And again, this is going to, this is using the middle phase to work on the basic conduct problems that are being presented. And this is a good one that's frequently used later on in, in the later phase when you're generalizing these findings. So solving, mutually solving problems in other, you know, phases of life, you know, peer relationships or school. So this is one of the um, skill sets that is taught to families as needed again when, it, when it's appropriate and it frequently is. Another set of interventions that are often used in functional family when working with children diagnosed with conduct disorder in their families is conflict management. Uh, conflict, um, so here in this case, the therapist is working initially with the uh, teen and the family to resolve conflict in a healthy way. So, you know, helping them to learn how to stay focused on the specific issue. Um, you know, working on having a mindset where they're willing to work things out, willingness to talk, staying oriented to the present rather than bringing up every, you know, incident from the past. So helping them learn how to have effective disagreements, effective conflict is very important. And again, this can be generalized to other contexts in the later phases. Another set of skills that are frequently um, addressed in functional family therapy is basic communication, communication skills, both the teen and the family. So focusing on being responsible um, to others, being direct, brief communications, a lot, not long-winded tirades, being concrete and specific in requests and complaints, being congruent in how you say things, being an active listener, actually listening to others. And again, this is a skill set um, that is frequently taught and used uh, to, you know, to work with the families um, when using functional family therapy. Again, it may not be taught and used with all families, but it's a frequently used um, skill set that is taught to them. So with all of these interventions, there's really an emphasis on matching these, you know, communication skills, conflict management, parenting. All of those are really matching it to fit the family based on their culture, based on their current situation, you know, based on their particular problem sequence, the relational function, the organizational themes that have been discussed. And so this, even though we have these basic principles, um, all of these are tailored and adjusted to meet the unique family's individual needs. And that's really very much at the heart of this. It's not a cookie cutter approach as some people sometimes think evidence-based treatments are, but it's very much modifying all this to meet the needs of this specific family. Next, we're going to talk about working with diverse uh, families using functional family therapy. So like other systemic approaches, there isn't an actual theory of health or normalcy. It's not like healthy families look like this. That's not what is being said here. Instead, uh, there's, if you remember, the focus is on what's the function of the problem symptom? How do we achieve that in another way? And it goes without saying, if you're a functional family therapist, that you, that needs to be culturally appropriate or you know, using cultural guidelines as to what that might mean. And so there is this ability to really respect for various forms of family structures that uh, might be relevant to various different cultural groups. And so the goals are very much adapted and based on the family's cultural norms. So it's, it can be used and honors both collectivist and individualist value systems. And those sometimes need to be talked about directly, especially when you're working with immigrant families where the teen might have a 
align much more with individualist values and a parent may be aligning much more with collectivist values and that would be very much part of the organizational themes and looking at the function um, of the uh, symptoms and so this approach can certainly be um, appropriately used with diverse clients and there are specific studies working with Hispanics as well as with sexual identity and so you can um, those are discussed in the text if you want to go a little more in depth. So as mentioned at the beginning, this is an evidence-based treatment, meaning it is a manualized treatment that's been used um, and developed in clinical trials to work with conduct disorder and quote-unquote delinquent youth. It is used internationally, and it really is one of four widely recognized family treatments for conduct disorder. And it has uh, moderately superior um, outcomes to other traditional forms of treatment for um, adolescent youth uh, diagnosed with conduct disorder. And they have found that the rates of recidivism and relapse are correlated very much to the therapist's adherence to the model. So the more the therapist adheres to the F FFT model, um, the, 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 there's a reduced chance of relapse. And so again, this is an approach that has a very uh, strong uh, consistent evidence base for working with conduct disorder and also with substance abusing youth. I hope you found this lecture helpful and I encourage you to learn more about functional family therapy.